All right, so uh, welcome everyone to our first in-person uh, seminar of the semester, which will kick off with uh, Leo Marcotulli, who uh, is uh, a Hubble Fellow at Yale, and before that she was a grad student at uh, Clemson, is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, she is an expert on blazars, and so that's how she's going to be able to chase supermassive black holes at the dawn of the universe. Hi, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Also, this is my first talk in person after two years, so I'm very excited. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> yeah, so today I'm mostly going to tell you what I've done throughout my PhD and what I um, will do more uh, into my fellowship. I joined Yale about six months ago, so kind of settled in and tried to uh, finish up some research and also move on to new things. And maybe, yes, my research was about chasing supermassive black holes. And to give everybody, like to put everybody on the same page, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction of these powerful sources. So since the 1960s, we've kind of known that there was this new source clouds appearing in our sky. They were very bright at radio wavelengths, but when you look at them with optical, they just look like stars, like very point sources, very bright, and therefore they got the name of quasi-stellar radio sources or quasars. However, they were quite different from stars if you looked at their optical spectra because they showed, they showed emission lines, which is not expected from stellar processes, and therefore, people were very puzzled as to what these sources were because they bear a lot of similarities with another source class discovered 20 years earlier than that, which were named Cipher galaxies. These lines were also uh, redshifted, placing these objects very far away from us. Therefore, very bright, very far away, means that something else was powering uh, this emission, which wasn't just stellar processes, something else had to be um, powering these sources. And this I found very interesting that actually the first, uh, what we think it's the first report of a jet emanating from one of the sources was actually 1918 by Curtis, who looked several galaxies, M87, we all know this one. And he reports that there is this sort of streak of light emanating from the center. And as uh, technology advanced and radio interferometry became a big thing uh, throughout the 1900s, the uh, resolution achieved milliard seconds, and we could also uh, distinguish that these sources were very bright at their center in radius, but also could have these extended jets extending up to megaparsecs away from the center. And not only that, they were also knotted. So it wasn't just a streak of uniform radiation, but there were knots along the jets that were producing some radio emission. And they were also moving faster than the speed of light which was very confusing, but of course now we know this is just an effect of an orientation. So the jet is pointed very close to our other side, and these sources are moving very fast, but not beyond the speed of light. Further, in the 60s and 70s, uh, X-rays satellites started to fly and revealed that these sources were very bright at X-rays. And later in the 70s and 80s, they were also bright at gamma rays. So these sources were effectively uh, multi-broadband -broad emitters, and of course, depending on the way that we looked at, you saw different things, different structure, you were throwing different scales. But all of a sudden, um, in say at 1995, it came a complete pictures that unified all these different things you were seeing at different wavelengths. And these sources were actually understood to be active centers of galaxies or active mm -hmm. galaxies, nuclei. So these were uh, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, which are actively accreting from their surroundings. And some of these sources are also capable of powering these relativistic jets into the interstellar medium. But what is their structure? The structure. So maybe you're all familiar with this. It's a bit um, uh, of an introduction, but I want everybody to understand kind of the structure here so that we understand later what's uh, going to happen for the other sources that I have studied. So the center we said there is a supermassive black hole, and not too long ago we saw the first image of one of these black holes sent to the, the EHC collaboration, and this is the black hole of M87. And these black holes are surrounded by accretion disk that you see there in the image, and above and below the accretion disk there is a hot um, electron cloud that is called X-ray corona because it scatters the radiation of the disk into X-rays. Down here, you see uh, broadband spectral energy distribution of these AGNs. And so you see that the accretion disk is mainly peaking towards optical frequencies. 
and then the X-ray corona, of course, uh, extends up to a few 200 kV sort of emission. Then, a um, few parsecs away from the center, there is an obscuring uh, torus, which is a sort of donut-shaped uh, region made of gas and dust and cloud, which main, uh, mainly reprocesses, again, the accretion disk radiation and remits it in infrared. And for an SED, it just appears mostly towards the infrared. However, studies are now uh, looking at this object through X-ray um, surveys. And if you're looking on the side, and so you're intercepting the radiation from the dusty torus, your X-rays coming from the corona can be absorbed by the structure. And up here, you see an X-ray spectrum of these sources going from Compton thin, so the clouds are not very dense, to Compton thick region, where you see that the X-rays really um, uh, get diminished. And interestingly, these very Compton thick sources are the ones that we think produce the most of the X-ray radiation in our universe, but we know very, very few of them, and it's very difficult to find, and many groups are trying to uh, find this very heavily obscured AGM. And the final, and above and below the cloud, uh, the accretion disk, there are these clouds that move around the black hole. You can assume it's a virus move, motion. They re reprocess the accretion disk luminosity producing emission lines. Of course, the region very close to the black hole move faster and therefore the lines are broadened. Further away, they're uh, move slower and therefore these lines are quite narrow and they are referred to as broad line and narrow line region for this specific reason. And then finally, we have the relativistic jet. Now only about a 10% of AGM has this jet. Depending on the viewing angle, you can see down the funnel or on the side, and you would see different structures. But importantly, the sources that I was interested in were these above blazers. So you're really looking down uh, the jet at a viewing angle between five to 10 degrees. And interestingly, these kind of sources have been studied for a few decades now, but, um, oh yes, yeah, so let me just, this is a very brief uh, spectral energy distribution of one of these sources. It dominates the entire uh, SEDs from radio up to gamma rays. And these jets are thought, uh, the radiation from these jets is thought to be produced by the particles along the magnetic field lines uh, that funnel the jet. And at low energies, you usually uh, explain their emission through synchrotron emission. While at higher energies, the same electrons that move relativistically along the jet encounter a low energy photon field and upscatters it through inverse Compton. Now, the radiation field can be the same one produced by the synchrotron radiation, so it's synchrotron and Compton emission, or it can be external to the jet, so Berlin region accretion disk, and so we call it an external Compton scenario. Within blazer population models, it's also been understood that the sources, if you group them in bins of luminosity, here you see uh, again several SCDs of this population by the work of Disagini in 2017, it appears that they follow a peculiar sequence. So low luminosity sources have both their high energy, both peaks peaking at higher energies or higher frequencies. But if we go to higher and higher luminosity sources, these two peaks seem to shift towards lower frequencies, but they can reach volumetric luminosity of 10 to the 48 or 49 hertz per second. And in particular, the most luminous ones have their energy peak below 100 MeV, and so peaking mostly between 10 to 20 MeV energy range, and therefore we call them MeV lasers. And all of this is evident that those are the most important, more interesting lasers, or at least the ones that I've studied so far. And I'm going to try to convince you that why they're so interesting and why should we be studying them in particular. So these sources are amongst most powerful persistent objects in the universe. Again, to the left here, you see a broadband spectral energy distribution of a very high redshift source that uh, was studied, um, studied in 2017. The red data points are the data that we collected simultaneously uh, from different satellites, optical, X-rays, and gamma rays. Gray data points are just archival data that we added to the SED. And then the lines that you see are actually physical model lines, which you probably recognize first the synchrotron that I was telling you about before. This is the inverse compton radiation. And interestingly for this source, we start seeing a third peak right here, 
which actually comes from the accretion disk. So since these two peaks have shifted to lower energies, we see the accretion disk, we can model it, we can actually extract the mass of the black holes of these sources. So it's interesting to get the full broadband um, uh, energy distribution of the sources. And as you can see, is reaching 10 to 48 uh, Earth per second luminosity. Very powerful. And interestingly, uh, once you measure the accretion disk and you measure the jet power, you actually, it has been found that no matter which kind of source you're looking at, no matter the redshift, it seems that the jet power is exceeding the accretion disk luminosity. And why is this interesting? Well, if you think that the jet is just powered by accretion disk, then the two powers should be comparable to each other. But if the jet is more powerful, it means that it's tapping into an extra reservoir of energy which could be the black hole spin, for example. Of course, these studies have to be, uh, what we're trying to push is towards higher and higher edges to see if this relationship actually um, keeps holding even at further distances. They are very bright, and therefore we can detect them up to very, very high redshift at the stage when the universe was one to two billion years old. The farthest ones have been detected at redshift four point, uh, sorry, 5.7 now. And, the further we go in redshift, the more massive is the black hole. Um, in importantly, uh, yes, so to the left, you see here just a histogram of the masses of the black holes for high redshift sources. And you see that the red peaks towards more massive black holes of greater than billion solar mass black holes. So what's the problem here? Where more massive black holes, very high redshift, how did they form? So how did they grow so big such a short time? In such high numbers. So there isn't any selection bias that affects this comparison? Absolutely, yes. Okay. You're completely right. No, no, it's a very good question. There is definitely a selection bias. The farther you go, the, the more luminous sources you find most likely powered by the most massive black holes. Nonetheless, we are still finding these black holes with these high masses and those high redshifts. So it is a definitely a selection bias, but we are still seeing them. And uh, another way to look at these questions. He's also looking at the supermassive black hole space density as function of redshift, shown here from the work of Svarato et al. in 2015. The authors of this work actually found a very uh, peculiar trend. So if you look at the radio quiet sources, so the blue line here in the plot, those are the AGNs that do not have jets, and they peak in space density around redshift too. And so do many source classes, star forming galaxies, um, uh, stars. So this is a normal peak for space density of things in the universe. But if you look at the radio loud population, so actually the ones with jets, turns out that they peak quite earlier on in the history of the universe, about redshift four. So this tells you that there is a, a bunch of very massive black holes early on with powerful jets, possibly hinting to this connection between a jetted phase of an AGN and a, a fast black hole growth. However, this kind of study strongly rely on the number of sources you detect per redshift bin, because the further you have the redshift you go, the lesser and lesser sources you find, and also on the parameters of the jet. So with lasers, a very simple correction that you can um, apply is the so-called two gamma sphere correction, which where gamma is the bulk lorentz factor of the jet. So how fast are these electrons moving in the jet? And you are thinking of this as in, when you see a blazer, you're very lucky. You're seeing down the funnel of the jet. However, there probably is a large population of sources with jets, which are too faint because they're misaligned from our line of sight. And therefore, we need to account for their number to actually understand uh, the number of the black holes because these jets probably are powered same black hole masses and they're about at the same redshift. So it's just a geometrical correction. Uh, it's two times gamma square. And gamma for these sources can range between 10 to 15. This tells you that for every source you detect at that redshift with that black hole mass, you can imply the existence of 200 to 400 such sources at that same redshift. But you need to know gamma. To know gamma, you need to study the jet very precisely. And so uh, this is some of the work that uh, I will tell you about in a few slides. Can I ask about this book? Of so so these guys, which you mentioned, those which like like blazers, but with jet, which jet, does doesn't direct to us. So here they would be subset of the blue line of what, what's called radio quiet, or uh, no, those would be in the radio loud uh, regime. So mm -hmm. what they 
in this work particularly what they've done is use luminosity functions for the blazer population right. so the jetted sources and then use the two gamma square correction to basically derive the number density of black holes they just assume that all the sources with luminosity greater than 10 to the 47 where uh have had supermassive black holes of uh billion solar masses and so just multiply the luminosity function by 15. And so those should take into account all the sources that you're not seeing with the jet pointed at you, but they have the jet pointed elsewhere. The radio flight are really the ones without the jets. So norm, normal AGM. Uh, so this jet which not pointed towards us, we just don't see them. They just don't have them. Ah, so, okay. so radio flight is just like just the AGM accreting matter, right. but no jet. And radio loud? Uh, radio loud is the one accreting matter with the jet. But that jet can point at you or away from you. And this is the whole population. If it points away, we just don't see them. No, 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 no. That's but that's accounted for. Yeah. Okay, so this correction. quiet and loud is not doesn't refer to the way how, how we see it, but. Uh, but no, no, the physical difference of jet okay. or not jet. Yes, correct. So this is uh, co-moving gigaparsecs, I guess. What I'm confused about is why, if there's a an, if a system has a jet. When it's at redshift, the, the the density of systems with jets should only increase. No, I mean the sense, density of massive black holes should only increase, um, if anything, with decreasing redshift with with increasing time, because you don't lose the original massive black holes. And is there some reason oh. the they their luminosity turns off except when they're born? Um. That's a very good question. Uh, I'm uh, yes, that, that's a very very interesting point. So in these kind of studies, what we usually take into account is just basically uh, trying to construct the luminosity function with the available data from, in this case, was either gamma rays or X rays. So you take the knowledge of the blazers that you already have detected and try to bind them in luminosity and come in volume and try to understand their uh, total number density as function of time. It's also like if their luminosity changes as function of redshift or just the number density. And so that is kind of accounted for in the work. Why it would decrease is just, I suppose, yes, part of their evolutionary um, uh, path. And therefore they should, we don't know why exactly this happens, but there could be, for example, a transition here between more luminous um, blazers with like their x-rays and then you start seeing the the ones with gamma ray emitters and then they just decrease in luminosity as the um, redshift uh, decreases towards us whether those are the same sources uh, that I cannot answer like whether the jet is just like turns off at some point or it just decreases in luminosity we yeah I don't know if that yet because everything will become more easily detected at lower redshift, I assume, yeah. unless there's some. Yeah, yeah. Sort of so effect. there has to be a sort of evolution in those, the luminosity of these jets, uh, definitely. Thank you. All right. And the last piece of the puzzle that these sources are very interesting uh, to study for is the composition of the cosmic high energy background which basically is the entire emission of all the sources, result and unresolved, that emit in the universe from soft X-rays up to gamma rays. So in here in its intensities detected by different satellites, what has been understood is actually that, for example, in the gamma ray regime, so the high energy part of the spectrum, blazer can account for about 30% of the, what's called extragalactic gamma ray background or EGB for short, uh, below 100 GeV and then up to 100% if we go to higher and higher energies. And you can see this plot, this is just a zoomed in version of the total plot and the blazer contribution is shown by this gray line. So they account for a lot of, uh, in the gamma ray background regime, but if we move to lower energies, so to the cosmic extra background at this point, it's been understood that most of this background is produced by those AGNs that don't have jets. They just emit an X-rays through their coronal emission. And uh, however, uh, if we study the 
higher end of the spectrum. So in the, what we call hard X-ray regime, is, so above 10 keV, it's been understood that lasers can account 10, 20 percent, not more than that. But the same lasers that account for that little of the cosmic extra diagram are surmised to com uh, completely resolve the MEV background, so the middle part of the plot. And of course, those are the MEV lasers, the ones with which have the peak at MEV band. So of course, to better understand this population, you need to perform population studies at X-rays and gamma rays and try to uh, put this puzzle together. So I hope by now everybody's excited about lasers and why they're so interesting. But I thought, so I gave you a broad introduction of what did I do or that, what did we do throughout these past few years. So on the one hand, what we wanted to do is go uh, higher and higher and higher in redshift to completely characterize single sources and in order to basically understand their battle mass and jet power, uh, and in particular, this gamma factor. And then on the other hand, we wanted to do these population studies to understand how they evolve, how many lasers are there in the universe. And in general, we wanted to find uh, the luminosity function to explain their, uh, the number density of supermassive black holes. So for the single sources, uh, what did we do? Uh, very bright at MEVs. We yet we yet to have an MEV instrument to fly again because the last one died in 2000, and uh, we don't have another MEV instrument. So they are very bright, and the uh, strategy that we adopted was to first use the capabilities of the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which is a gamma ray satellite covering from 50 MEV to 2 TV, scans the whole sky every two hours has been in orbit since 2008, so a large amount of data and improved data sets. So this uh, instrument could give us the detection at gamma rays. And if we have that, we are actually sampling very well the falling part of the external Compton emission. And since the high energy emission is produced by the jet, we want to constrain it very well to understand the jet power, right? So we have the falling part here of this uh, spectral energy distribution. Once we have it with a lot, we had to propose for time with a very sensitive hard X-ray instrument, NUSTER, covering from 3 to 80 keV, works in a pointing mode. So you just need to submit proposals, ask it to please point at that particular part of the sky. And if you get time with it, you actually are um, extremely important for these high sources because you're sampling very well the rising part of the external component emission. And once you have both X-rays and gamma rays, you constrain very well the position of the peak. So you can tell those are MEV lasers because the peak is at MEV band. You can constrain the particle population responsible for the emission. And you can also constrain uh, these gamma factors, which are we are interested in. Another, um, since broadband emitters, what we wanted also to obtain was uh, soft X-rays, UV, optical, as many data as we could and as simultaneously as possible because the sources are very variable. So we went into a time with SWIFT, which has on board a soft X-ray telescope, so between 0.3 to 10 keV, as well as an optical monitor. And then we were partners with optical telescopes a bit around the globe to get optical data. And this was very fundamental because with soft X-rays, we could complement the high energy um, uh, the rising part of the external quantum spectra, again, particle population, and just uh, gamma factor of the jet. In the optical, instead, what we could get was the accretion disk emission for the sources. And if you can model it again, you can get the black hole mass estimate as well as accretion disk luminosity. And if the sources don't have spectroscopically measured mass, it has been shown that this method uh, provides a quite uh, disagreement with spectroscopic mass measurements. So you can actually tell the mass of these black holes. So overall, should, should I be concerned about that uh, UVOT point that's really low? Am I seeing that right? You're seeing that right. And you should not be concerned too much because <laughs> the rest of this is 3.4. But usually, the UV at that point gets absorbed by the lamb and alpha forest in between. Uh -huh. So we just tend to ignore it. We're like, that's, that's not real. <laughs> what we care more about is the optical for this source. And so these two data points here. And you may ask also, why don't we just follow the archival one? Again, it's more for variability purposes. So uh -huh. these data are, are taken 
the red ones are taken as simultaneously as possible so that we're assembling really this the state of the source at that particular moment. I so, see. so that really is an absorption, that low point. Yes, that's yeah, exactly. I think yeah, I had a plot at some point showing the fall off, but you see also here it's kind of like oops. If you look at the at these data points, which are travel ones, it kind of yeah. seems to like fall sharply, yeah. and while the accretion disk should be more of a, a bump kind of structure. So yeah, so overall, what we have done is characterize nine uh, high redshift blazers so far. We have four more candidates, and we went to the highest redshift of four point three, which is the highest redshift in gamma rays uh, of gamma ray detected blazers. And we've characterized their black hole masses and gamma factors. And on average, it seems, well, they all have billion solar mass black holes, which is great. But then their bulk learning factor is on average uh, 10. Now, this not, may not seem like a great result, but so far, people have, have used for the highest energy sources and most powerful one, gamma 15. And this actually gives us a hint that maybe the highest redshift, the lower the gamma factors of these jets. And this tells you um, it's implied in the two gamma square correction. So there is a difference between 200 and 400 sources, which again, translate in supermassive black holes with density uh, numbers, which may be lower than expected. So these single sources. Now let's talk about the fun stuff, which is the population of sources. Population of sources uh, for these uh, blazers, where we did two kind of studies, but the first one I'll tell you about is the one in gamma rays. So we wanted to understand the density of blazers about 100 MeV. And if you see on the background here, this is the old sky uh, count map obtained by the Fermi Large Area Telescope. You probably recognize the plane of our Milky Way in the center. And then if you go above and below galactic latitudes, you see those points everywhere. Those are mainly just blazers at gamma rays. So to do this, to understand their population, in this case, what we wanted to understand is their source count distribution. So how many sources are there per flux bin, detected and undetected? And to do so, um, I'm going to skip over the details, but I'm going to give you the main recipe for the method that we use, which is called the efficiency correction method. So the first thing that you needed was to have a catalog of real blazers. So we took the data at the time, eight years of uh, the best data set released by the lab collaboration, which is named FAST8. We only wanted to consider blazers. So we got above and below 20 degrees in galactic latitudes, uh, produced an analysis pipeline that would give us uh, a detection very close to what the official catalog gave you. So we had our list of sources, our list of real blazers. Then, of course, every survey has its biases, and therefore we needed to perform Monte Carlo simulations to derive the service biases. And this uh, Monte Carlo simulation gave us an important function, which is the efficiency of the instrument. And I'll show you in a second what it looks like, but the efficiency is basically the probability as function of flux that your instrument would detect sources. And once you know this probability, you can take your real catalog, correct it for it, and then you get your intrinsic source and distribution. So how are actually blazers distributed in terms of numbers as function of flux? And I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to the uh, details of this study, but if you have questions, please do ask. What I'm going to show you is two things. First of all, this is the efficiency. And again, it's a probability. So for high fluxes, it's basically one. You're detecting all the sources in the sky. As you go to low fluxes, this rises slightly be, uh, below one, uh, sorry, above one, which is where there's a probability. But this is a known uh, bias called the Eddington bias, which affects real detection. And you have to take it into account with your uh, real catalog. And then, of course, at some point, this just drops to zero. So you have that, you have your catalog, and now you have your intrinsic can source. I, can I ask that, that bias? That you see, that's that's because you have a very steep, steep count. That that there's the 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 things you know tend to fluctuate above above your your flux limit. Is that the cause of that? Yes, correct. So this is basically as we are reaching towards the limit sensitivity limit of the instrument. 
is basically your instrument is more likely to pick up sources that are intrinsically fainter than the limit, the sensitivity limit of the instrument. But since every flux has uh, its error, basically you are detecting the sources with your intrinsic flux plus their, that delta f. And so you're detecting them with a higher flux that is intrinsically. And that's where this bias come from. And so this this depends, this will change depending on what you assume about the, the real source count as a function of flux. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and in fact, to do this, we have um, uh, simulated different uh, intrinsic source count population of blazers with different shapes to all like, uh, then they gave us the statistical uncertainty, but basically, yeah, that was an unknown of our work <coughs> and just derived the efficiency of uh, how would your instrument see those simulated catalogs and then therefore how much this fluctuation would affect the real detections. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is the intrinsic source and distribution. In this case, it's plotted as function of energy flux. The data points are the ones derived from our work. The gray shaded area are the systematic uncertainties. And there are two things that I want you to take out of this plot. First of all, we've characterized this function an order of magnitude lower in flux than previously done by any other work. And what we could also do is to basically overplot the prediction from different evolutionary models of blazers to understand whether there was any difference or if we could tell whether which kind of evolution these sources were following. Now, I will talk about these models in a second for another work, but in general, you think about the evolution of this population that can happen in density. Mm -hmm. So as you go higher in redshift, these sources are more or less numerous, but luminosity stays more or less the same. They can evolve in luminosity. Their luminosity increases or decreases as function of redshift. Number density is more or less the same, or it's a mix of the two. So what we do, it did in this case, it was just take the prediction from those models from uh, IELA 2015 work and overplot it to our source scan distribution to see if there was any preference. And it turns out that amongst the various ones that we've tried, actually the blue line, so the cyan PDE model is the one that better explains both the energy flux distribution and uh, we also did this study in photon flux. And overall, the PDE is the one that describes better the data that we have. Um, this is not a fit, it's just like an overplotting, okay? And I'm cautious to say that it's the third model, but we could see some difference between the three, which was not possible until this work. And so overall, when, once we had this distribution, we can then ask ourselves the question, okay, how much do they contribute to the background? It turns out that they can contribute 50 to 60% at most. So it's a high number, but it's not 100. And other studies have actually shown that if you take into account other source classes, such as star forming galaxies and radio galaxies, which, has, which are very much fainter than blaze or gamma rays, but much more numerous, they could account for 100% of the total background without having to account for um, more exotic processes such as dark matter annihilation. Uh, however, the update of this work has, uh, we need to, to redo it basically. And so overall, this is what was done at gamma rays, population studies showing uh, that possibly a density evolution is happening for these sources, and that their contribution to the background is about yeah, 60%. And finally, what, uh, since we were really interested in these MEV blazers, very high redshift, very massive black hole, we wanted to understand how do they evolve throughout the universe. So in this case, we used another old sky instrument called the Swift First Era Telescope, which covers between 14 and 195 kV, so hard X-rays. And what you see here is the old sky map of sources detected by this instrument. The gray um, data points on the background are all the sources detected by the catalog. And guess what? The stars are our blazers. So you can see just by eye that they're not the majority of the sources detected uh, at X-rays, it's just a 10%. But, and they're about 150 sources, no more than that. But it's enough to perform these luminosity function studies, which now tells us uh, how many sources are there per bin luminosity per homoid volume. Where is the galaxy? There's just some different coordinates, right? Uh, no, no, that's still galactic coordinates. This is the galactic plane. Oh, because I thought you were saying that you were cutting out 
lasers at about 20 degrees. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is just the whole schema. Uh, I will cut for the work. I was just uh, showing what overall the bat sees. Yeah, correct. Right. And in fact, for this kind of work, we perform a similar set of cuts as you were mentioning. So first of all, we needed a keen, what we call a keen sample. It means that you needed to have a sample just of lasers that had flux and redshift measurements because you want the mean oxygen. And then you need to have a set of cuts to minimize the uncertainties. And in this case, we just needed sources detected above a signal to noise uh, of five by the catalog. They had a minimum flux uh, dictated by the sky coverage, which I'll show in a second. And also um, above galactic latitudes, in this case, we decide uh, 10 degrees Kelvin latitudes uh, with respect to B4. So we had an overall 112 sources to deal with. And if the uh, biases from the lab mostly come from the flux of the sources, in the case of the BAT, it depends on the exposure of the instrument. So this is again of the map, the, an exposure map from the bat instrument. And as you can see, it's just color coded uh, in how many megaseconds has the instrument survey different parts of the sky. And you see that some areas are like white, so they've been covered for, they've been covered for almost a year, but other uh, sides of the sky have been sampled for just 10 megaseconds. And then of course, if you want to source the detect above signal to noise five, this will depend on how long has your instrument pointed at a certain uh, direction of the sky. And if you encode this information in a survey bias, it's gonna be very similar to the efficiency that we saw before. That's called sky coverage. And it's calculated only for sources uh, detected as signal to noise above five. And as you can see that you have above uh, certain fluxes, this is uh, one basically. So it's hundred percent of the sky. And then slowly, slowly you see uh, fewer and fewer sources. So a limiting flux here, which is five times to the minus 12, basically you would see one source at this flux uh, just in, um, in 300 square degrees of the whole sky. So you're really losing, like it's just 1% of the cover sky there. So you really need to correct for these values when you take these um, this, uh, studies into account. So you have the whole setup. The last thing that you need is a luminosity function model. And again, we just use the three that I just mentioned before. Are these evolving in density, in luminosity, or is it a mix of the two? And can we tell? Well, we cannot tell, unfortunately. So this is the uh, luminosity function of blazers. Uh, I mean, blazers and x-rays plotted to the left as function of redshift, to the right as function of luminosity. There are two main things that you can take away from this plot. First of all, if you look at the luminosity one, you see that no matter the redshift bin you go, this is a straight power law. Now, this is a problem because what we would like to see is sort of a break that tells us whether a luminosity or a density evolution is taking place because if it's just a straight power law, we cannot discern these two scenarios aside. And in fact, the results from the fits are just the same. Now you can tell me, well, we see something here, but within statistical uncertainty, this is not like we cannot place strong constraints of this turnover, and therefore we cannot tell which the um, evolution is taking place. On the other hand, if you look at the one on redshift, what is quite evident is that we are not we are yet to detect the peak in space density, uh, as in a turnover on uh, the luminosity function. But if you look at the most luminous sources, it's obvious that this is beyond redshift four. Actually, the best fit tells us that this is indeed around redshift 4.3, as we were showing before. So these very luminous, very powerful sources, most likely powered by billion solar mass black holes, actually peak in density above redshift 4, around 4.3, telling us that there is, again, this strong connection between the projected phase of the AGN and this strong mass of black hole growth. And we need to like keep looking for the reason why is this happening. And further, what we could do is derive an average LCD for these blazers at high energy. And this allowed us to understand that, first of all, at X rays, they don't contribute very much. Now, the two lines that you see here is so this is again the X ray background. The two lines is the contribution for blazer using a luminosity evolution model and a density evolution model. Now, you can see that there is quite a difference here, but 
I'm going to model these blazers that um, X rays contribute at most some 10% to the total emission. But if we extrapolate their contribution to MEV range, they can actually account for 100% of the MEV background. We caution here, of course, you, you can probably see by eye that the uh, uncertainties on these extrapolations are quite large. Not only that, the PDE model seems to quite over predict the MEV background that we know so far. This gives us a bit of a hint that possibly a luminosity evolution is more likely in these source classes, although the errors are very large, so we cannot draw a strong conclusion. But we also know that for sure there are other source classes besides Blazor contributing a bit to this background. Supernovae, for example, are known to come, they can contribute like 10% of this MEV background. So actually, the luminosity function could give us that wiggle range of uh, some more source classes contributing in this range. So maybe luminosity more than the energy. And finally, um, uh, what we could do with the luminosity function of just of blazers, we ask ourselves the question, okay, but who, what are the parents population of the source class? So what are the larger uh, population that has jets, misaligned so we don't see them, and can we tell? To do so, what, you, what we needed to understand is how beaming affects a luminosity function so that we could derive their parent population. And this is work done in, in the 80s by Yuri and Schaefer. I'm just gonna give you a very quick rundown of the map behind it, but it's, it's just a very simplified version of uh, the concept here. So you probably know that uh, if you have a beam source, the observed luminosity, this L, is related to the intrinsic luminosity of the source by its factor delta P with delta the kinematic Doppler factor and P an index that depends on the configuration of the jet and or the emission processes happening in the jet. Then you can tell, okay, my parent population, so the broad population of jet sources is distributed with in luminosity just as a simple power law. You can do more complex shapes, but let's assume it's just a power law. Then we can tell, okay, my jets are distributed uh, uniformly in the sky with just a sine function. And let's just assume for simplicity that all jets have the same gamma factor. So we can extract a probability density of the delta factors from which you can combine it to find a probability that you will uh, observe a certain luminosity given a certain delta factor, which is again distributed as this power with this new index. Uh, and then with this, you can derive your observed luminosity function. So you start with a power law of intrinsic population, and then your beam luminosity function is this phi L. But the main takeaway result from this map that you can look at your paper, it's very interesting, is just this, that you start with a simple power law, you boost it, and your beam luminosity function is now a broken power law. At the high luminosity end, it's the same power law with the same index. Normalization differs because it's different uh, kind of uh, sources. But then there hits a luminosity break right here, and there is a flattening of this luminosity function, which yet again, we do not see in our data, but this is what we kind of expect to see. So we can do the reverse uh, sort of argument. Now we have our beam luminosity function, which is what we derive. So we can derive the intrinsic luminosity function of our parents, try to compare with known uh, population of other uh, beam sources and see if they can actually be the parents of our blazers. Doing so, you perform a multivariate fit to the data, which results in uh, this uh, plot that you see here. Now, this is just an example. We've tried different values of P's and different values of other parameters. But as you can see now, again, our luminosity function, straight power law, you cannot see the breaks, so it's very difficult to fit uh, all the integrals that go into this kind of work, but then you can derive basically the number uh, densities of the parents of this population, and then compare with what we know. In this case, we call them radio galaxies, and we compared with numbers from um, FR2 sort of galaxies, which are radio galaxies, so they have powerful jets. And depending on the luminosity being our numbers sort of agree and sometimes are a bit too high, but since this fit cannot be done exactly in terms of like since we don't even see a break it's very difficult to even fit these kind of functions and we cannot make strong claims. 
Another thing we can derive, though, is uh, for the blazer population, what is the average um, viewing angle to which you would uh, kind of like see the jets? And again, very narrow, uh, three degrees from our line of sight, which is kind of expected because as you go to higher and higher angles, you just don't see the source in x-rays. And for the gamma factors, what we could derive is that on average, seems to be that these jets are um, have a gamma factor of eight, eight to 10, which again is pointing to the fact that these jets are fast, but they're not that fast. They're not what people usually expect for these sort of sources. And therefore, it affects the number density of the total population. So overall, that was the uh, take home message from this work. And the last bit of the puzzle was try to understand how, um, since these blazers are assumed to contribute 100% of the MEV background, if we were ever to fly an MEV mission, what would this mission see? in terms of numbers. So we uh, extrapolated the source scan distribution of these sources as function of different energy uh, bits in the MEV regime. And so those are the different lines that you see here. Depending on the you know, flux limit of your instruments, it's 10 to the minus 12. And depending on the MEV band, you can see 1,000, if not 10,000 sources. And this is uh, incredibly important because many missions, I don't know if any of you is, in, uh, is involved with any of those, but there have been many missions proposed in the MEV regime to fly again after, since we don't have any. And so Amigo, which has uh, not passed the NASA review after the Kittle survey, would have detected about 3,000 uh, or 2,400 sources. COSY instead has been approved. However, COSY will maybe sample 60 lasers. Uh, and then there is a, a lunar observatory. And uh, just in comparison for these numbers, I just put E or Zeta. Uh, that is soft X ray, very soft X rays, and it would detect uh, 50,000 sources. However, not being in the MEV band, E or Zeta will see thousands of lasers, but we will not know their MEV lasers until we sample the whole peak, gamma rays and X rays. So uh, it would be a fun uh, follow up, I suppose, mission. But um, so the prospect in the MEV bands are quite quite bright. So overall, this is a summary of the latest work, which has just been submitted to UPJ, where we derived the most up-to-date X-ray luminosity function of lasers and understood that their peak is actually a ratio 4.3 to 4.5, and they can contribute up to 100% of the MEV background, and possibly their parents is this effort to uh, kind of galaxies. So this brings me basically to the summary and conclusion of this work. And I'll give you a brief overview on what the future will bring. So in general, uh, we have studied high redshift lasers with gamma ray and x-rays, and we keep asking for time. We keep getting data. I have four to six more sources now. We have the new log and log acid gamma rays, and we have the new x-ray luminosity function. Now, what, what's left to do? Well, quite a few things, right? So first of all, how are these jet triggered? And how is their connection to supermassive black hole growth? Um, how do we come to these kind of sources? Now, one idea of how this supermassive black hole grow is through mergers. And also in the higher TV universe, merger rates should be higher than it's now. So maybe there is this connection between fast mergers and then mergers possibly triggering a jet. And therefore, you have this connection between jetted phase of an AGN and a supermassive black hole. However, you go higher in redshift, you start seeing just point sources in the sky. You cannot have any uh, resolution to see if these sources are merging or were merging. So what we said, a collaborator of ours has found uh, in 2020, he found a low power jet very close by to us into a, what's, what's called a gamma ray narrow line sieper galaxy. So it's an AGN. Narrow line sievers is just depending on their optical spectrum. The gamma ray part tells you that it's detected at gamma rays, and gamma ray detection usually means jets pointed towards our line of sight. Where these jets are lower power than the blazer ones, so they're like 10 to the 46, 47 ergs, and can be studied in uh, high details since they're close by. So they follow these sources up with uh, infrared imaging and spectroscopy, and this is the infrared image of this source. So here is the radio contour of the jet. So this is the AGN with the jet next to it, a merging companion. They are at the same redshift, confirmed by spectroscopy. And the second one is an AGN itself. 
and models show of merger um, history show that actually there is a point on these merging uh, AGNs where a jet should be triggered and possibly AGN activity in the second merging convenience can be triggered. So it makes sense. Though it's not a conclusive proof because it's just one source nearby. And so what we're doing now is take all the gamma ray narrow and super known, 10 sources, not more than that, and follow them up with infrared, uh, infrared spectroscopy, sorry, infrared imaging and optical spectroscopy. And so far, the images of this show, many, basically most of them are, there is a companion. Whether it's a companion, we need to confirm it by, by a spectroscopy because it could just be a background galaxy. But it, it's interesting because if all of them actually have this sort of behavior, then it could be sort of a proof that this is a viable way to have both supermassive black holes and jets. And then further work needs to be done to update the gamma ray laser luminosity function study so that actually discern how it's, they are behaving as function of redshift. And um, then of course, this links to the supermassive black hole space density of these jetted sources. And in general, we just, keep chasing higher active lasers and another endeavor is try to produce an MEV catalog by using the lab data because lab actually looks down to 20, from 20 MEV up to one TV, but the low energy range has never really been explored because it's very problematic. The PSF is huge. Detection is very complex, but we're making progress. Uh, we're building this catalog, which for now has about a thousand sources and about 300 of them are have never been detected before in gamma rays. So they could actually be these MEV lasers, but uh, updates soon. Anyways, thank you very much for listening and uh, you, any questions are welcome. So let's see. Uh, we have questions in the chat. Is anybody, and I can go back and forth. Just a quick question. Which redshift for these merging AGMs? Uh, it's about 0 0.1, so they're very close by, yeah. Uh, okay, and Mike has a question. Yeah, on the Erosita comparison, if, just so I understand it correctly, yes. basically saying they're detectable by Erosita, but, but you can't tell they're a blazar. Exactly. We right. cannot tell there. Yes, correct. Yeah, so, so I mean, we could also, like, there's probably some instruments that could detect them. So, so... <laughs> So in some sense, I mean, you're like that doesn't that doesn't argue against the other, you know, mission proposals. Correct, correct. Yeah, it was just a comparison in terms of numbers, but absolutely, yeah. you would need an MEV mission more. You see, that would be great, but then we need to follow it up with so many more instruments to see if they're actually MEV lasers. Right. Okay. So, um, what is the so I think you said it at the beginning, but what is the best imaging we have of the sky at <laughs> relevant MEV frequencies? Uh, so it used to be Comtel, uh, and right. that uh, died in the Atlantic Ocean, I think, in 2000. And it was, I think, it had maybe 10 sources, it was right. very low resolution. But, but did it did it have good enough background subtraction that you know the kind of DC level of photons in the? Do you know the cosmic uh, like spectra or intensity, or is that is that unknown at the MEV? So what we have is definitely the measurement of the background, which is um, yeah. And do you believe that? I guess I'm uh, interested in what's the what are the systematics in that background? You then? are absolutely right. Well, I So actually, I was. So this is this is the best one. I see. Yes, I remember. This is the end. Yeah, right. Uh, so actually, I was giving this talk at some point to another audience, but what they uh, what they suggested is that actually the background in MEV is quite well known in terms of like the uncertainties are quite large. But we should sort of trust these data points. It's not that off from the real detection. Because there aren't many other sources. Yeah, there. exactly, exactly. So possibly an MEV mission will just lower the, the error bars, but the level should be about here, exactly. also connecting quite well the two. And how, how important are those data to your argument that the blazars are dominating the? Uh, we're quite important in terms of, uh, so we don't really, we just see whether the line fits the whole uh, intensity right. there. And 
that and is you don't the have alternative sources no so uh, i guess one just very this somehow in my mind this is all related it might not seem related to you but uh -huh. your number counts are also s squared the n the s yes is approximately flat yes is that the power law that is hard to integrate like uh, I'm, I'm having a little trouble in my head saying what the integral of that is but because oh. you're very close to flat in s squared the end yes and that's that's most which is related to mike's plot. question about like how steep is the thing mm -hmm. it's pretty steep and does that mean that you kind of like logarithmically divergent at the low luminosity end like does well, do, that's... do details of that slope at the low luminosity end matter a lot um they do in terms when you do luminosity function studies it's yes you like it cannot just be a straightforward power that keeps right. going there yeah, is right. a turnover Something at some point turnover, yeah. yes and i think um we get we don't see it like the way i plotted it there is just for it's easier to visualize like yeah. otherwise it's just a line yeah, yeah uh and we do not see the turnover or swing gamma rays that's a very good point but yes it usually uh and this will be related to the luminosity function studies the recent work has kind of been able to very well model sort of the peak of these mm -hmm. lasers across cosmic time. So you kind of know when they turn yeah, over, I even see, if yeah. it's not evident from the yes, lens, just look at the lens. Yeah, correct. Got it. Uh, right, because it's integrating over redshift. Yes, Got yes, it. exactly. Yes, so at good. that point, you actually see the little peak that <laughs> yeah, yeah. shifts in the redshift, good, uh, understood. Yeah. which we cannot see in the x-rays, unfortunately. Okay, any other questions? Not let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much.